If you've ever noticed mold or dampness in your home, particularly in areas where you or your family members sleep, then I'd highly recommend that you listen to today's episode. My guest today is Martin Matson. He's a biohacker with an extraordinary story on how exposure to mold affected not just his, but his family's health. Alongside this, we also delve into a wide range of topics, including what happens if you're exposed to mold, if high LDL and APOB cholesterol is bad for you, biohacking tools for better health, Martin's view on the use of statins, how to reduce toxins in daily life, how to test for and remove mold in your home, how to recover from mold exposure, the best way to track health metrics, how to fix fatigue and brain fog, supplementation and liver values, how to heal your gut, what are detox fats and why they're important, the benefits of activated charcoal, saturated fat and detoxification, and whether or not you should stop taking creatine. Disclaimer, many of the views discussed in this podcast do not align with that of the mainstream healthcare narrative. This is an alternative viewpoint and therefore implementing any of the approaches outlined in this podcast, you do so at your own risk. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner. Unfortunately, due to a technical error, this episode cuts off the last 20 minutes of our episode. However, there is still plenty for you to dig into. Please also check out Martin's work via his Instagram and website, which will be linked in the show notes. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Martin Matson. What's a biohacker? A biohacker is someone who changes the environment inside of yourself and around yourself to reach peak performance to make your body work optimally. And that's the definition that Dave Asprey uh, came up with uh, once upon a time. And there are people call it different things nowadays. Like I call myself a bio optimizer and I focus a lot on the supplements and the lifestyle and the diet that you can change uh, mainly. Uh, and you can do a lot of change their body that way. But uh, biohacking also includes things like gadgets, red lights, blue lights, workout machines and uh, rings that measure your heart rate and uh, all those uh, kinds of things and uh, some people take it to the extreme when they're taking ice baths and they're shooting lasers into their brains to stimulate different parts of the brains and there's a huge amount of things that you can do and it's uh, all really exciting um, but what I want to do is I want to take the kind of middle class normal person who hadn't heard about biohacking before and make it more mainstream uh, because there's so much untapped uh, potential there and cool. we are uh, exposed to a lot of toxins as well nowadays and people don't know it so they perform less well even though they don't know that they're affected by it so that's something that i need to open up uh, people's eyes for as well mm. and uh what's uh what brought you to to this point today? Like, tell me your background. What's your story? Oh well, so when I grew up, uh, I was one of the most allergic uh, kids in Sweden, and we were at the ER every month because I got into anaphylactic shock and my throat swelled up, so I couldn't breathe. And the doctors always said that there's nothing that you can do about it. You have to just learn to live with it. And my parents always had to be with me and ask, what kind of knife did you use? Did you clean it properly? And what kind of uh, oil do you use when you're cooking and stuff like that? And I had, yeah, I had a nurse with me when I ate uh, at the school restaurant. And so they were always ready to give me a, an adrenaline shot if anything were to happen. But then when I grew up, when I moved out of the environment that I grew up, my allergies disappeared. The doctors just said that sometimes that happens and it's just called that it grows away is what they say, hmm. but I didn't buy that. So I started doing my own research uh, to find out why it disappeared and if it can, if I can make it disappear even more because I still had allergies to pollen, for example, or horses and dogs. And so uh, when I started fixing my gut, the bacteria that lived in my gut, 
everything got a lot better. And then I didn't have my allergies anymore. So I, I went a couple of years without my allergies at all. And so that's when I started to understand that there is things that we can do. And that's when I found, well, Dave Asprey, who was talking about mold in, in this case. And he said that everything that we put in our body affects how we perform and how we behave. And I just thought that, yeah, but like mold, that's, that's something that you can see. That's something that if you see it, you remove it. So there's not a lot of people who are affected by it. But then in my early 30s, I bought a house with my ex-girlfriend. And as soon as I moved into the house, I started to feel like absolute crap. I was always a driven person before, started five businesses from scratch and always done a lot of working out. And all of a sudden I was just depressed, unmotivated. I didn't even want to go out of the bed. I didn't have any energy. And my brain just stopped working. I had so much brain fog that I couldn't even comprehend the things that I was reading. I couldn't take in new information. I, I, I couldn't understand what was happening. And it was, it just came out of a clear blue sky. And then just a couple of weeks after we moved into the house, uh, my ex-girlfriend, she collapsed unconscious on the floor. And so we went to the emergency room and I just said that, well, she's probably overworked. She's uh, not slept enough. And so I didn't know any better. <laughs> and we just went home and she didn't know any better either. Uh, but then two weeks after that, it happened again. And no one still didn't make any uh, connections. So this time we got mad at her. So they just said that we have been taking drugs. You're in ecstasy. Stop lying to us. We know that people that don't just collapse uh, left and right. So there's something that you're doing and, and you're overworked and everything. And I probably should have defended her more, but uh, I was like, yeah, you probably should get some rest. You should probably work less. But in my head, it still didn't make any sense because she was working a lot less at the time than she was when I met her. So it shouldn't be better and not worse. But then the third time, a couple of weeks again after that, and this time they were like, no, they shaked everything. They shaked the EKG, they shaked their vitamins and minerals, and they got blood, and they even sent her into an fMRI to scan her brain, and everything came back normal and fine, and they just said that you have to stop lying to us, you have to stop taking those drugs, and this is not normal, and this doesn't happen, like, People don't just collapse left and right. And so I told her that go sleep on the second floor. At least that way you don't get disturbed by the kids and the dogs and everything else. So you can get proper sleep. And she went to sleep upstairs and it didn't happen to her for three years. And so we kind of forgot about it, but I was still as depressed. I still didn't have any motivation. I still didn't have any will to do anything. I was even suicidal at the times, which is completely unlike me. And everything that happened, every small little thing, like pushed my buttons. I was like triggered by everything. I was more angry than I wanted to be. And, and I didn't recognize myself at all. And even the dog got sick by the mold and, and she started attacking the other dogs out of just nowhere, which is also completely unlike her. And so three years after that, I collapsed uh, on the bathroom floor. So I went up to the bathroom in the middle of the night and I, I remember sitting down on the toilet. And then next thing I know, I wake up on the bathroom floor and I just think that this was a really bad dream. Like what happened? I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any pain or anything, but when I opened my eyes in front of me, I saw three of my front teeth. Uh, and then when I stood up, I looked into the mirror. I saw that um, my face was completely filled with blood. Yeah. I still just thought this was a dream. And so I went into 
my ex-girlfriend's bedroom and I told her that she should probably get me to the hospital. And on top of this, it was in the middle of November and it was uh, 30 degrees below Celsius at this time. And some of us have to convert that into Fahrenheit, but it's really... I'm so glad cold. you said Celsius. Yeah, I don't do Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll have to convert it themselves. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Re really freaking cold uh, anyway <laughs> and so i started to how do you say it in english here when you start shivering your teeth shivering yeah in your, yeah shivering, shivering. Your teeth. yeah, yeah chattering your teeth, teeth. Yeah. yeah so i'm having a teeth so i was shivering my under teeth into the roots of my oh wow oh my teeth and that hurts Jesus. so bad that unlike anything i've experienced in my life uh, so, so that was a really traumatic uh, experience. And when I get uh -huh. to the hospital, I get the same kind of uh, thing that my my ex girlfriend did. There's nothing wrong with you. Uh, you look as healthy as can be. You're working out, and you have a lot of muscles. And if there's nothing wrong with your values anywhere, uh, and then the head doctor he told me that. The thing with, with your teeth, that's only cosmetic, so like there's nothing we can do about it. It's, <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean just cosmetics? It's like, <laughs> mm. this is not normal. This doesn't happen like to normal people. Like, you just collapse. And then after that, then it, it didn't take so long to, to fix the teeth. At first, you can just put composite, put plastics, and your teeth look swell. So it only took a day before my teeth were usable again um, but then the, when I scanned my t teeth they saw that um, the roots were broken off so the teeth would die if I if I left them so I have to pull uh, two of the teeth and we could s save two of the teeth so they have crowns now and so that process took almost two years to extract the teeth and then put in a new bone and then put screws and then put crowns onto that. And um, all during that time, I didn't have any teeth, so it was, it was always like, drooling blood and it smelled like death in my mouth. And um, so during this time, I accidentally <laughs> happened to meet my uh, new girlfriend, who is now my wife. And I don't know if she got off uh, on, the, on, the, on the teeth thing or anything, but. <laughs> My sister, <laughs> said, my, my sister said it best. She she asked, "Is she blind?" <laughs> she could see your your true being was radiating out. Yeah, exactly. That's Nothing what she to do with your least. teeth. That's beautiful, yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. So we ended up. Maybe that's what I need to do: and... smash my teeth out to find the right woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the best advice I can give you. <laughs> yeah. Like just like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you know that they they're not they don't just like a pretty face. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so anyway, obviously I had to move out of the house to be with my new girlfriend. And when I moved out of the house, it was like a completely new human being. I was like, I was back again. I, I bought a cabin that I was going to live with in case I didn't happen to meet a new girlfriend and at the exact same time. And so, but since I didn't meet a new girlfriend, that cabin was, no one was going to live there. So I rented it out on Airbnb and I opened a business and like, I was completely back again and I was motivated and I was uh, excited about life and I was absolutely not suicidal at all. And then I made, just to confirm what happened, I made a urine, urine test to test how much mycotoxins I had in my urine. And even after I moved out of the house, I had more than 100% more uh, mycotoxins than uh, regular people have in their urine. So obviously there was something uh, with the house that we lived in. And like looking back at it, it makes 
total sales and like someone with half a working brain cell could have figured it out faster than we did but <laughs> because the house is completely made out of wood and there's no isolation there's nothing the house is made from 1910 1920s and they didn't build the house no in, the uh, insulation by the way i just thought yeah. correct you there okay okay <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's all right yeah so so uh there was mold and we we had a, a carpenter there to to paint the outside of the house and he was like we have to fix this we have to change this um, because there's mold everywhere so in mm -hmm. left respect we could have you know solved it faster and got rid of it faster um but you're also just completely brain dead when you are exposed to mold like you can't think properly you can't see the solutions that everyone else can see um like everyone that looked at us from the outside, they said that there was something wrong with the relationship. They said there was something wrong with uh, the job that I had. There was something wrong with uh, the gym that I had. It was like always something wrong with my lifestyle. And um, I ended up going to five different therapists during this time. And um, we had a men's, men's group in, in Gothenburg where I live. And all of those things helped a lot. They were awesome. and. They helped me to deal with my childhood traumas and the fact that I was bullied when I was a kid and all of those things, but I was still equally suicidal the next day when I woke up. So that's when I understood that there's more to this. There's different parts of this and, and they both have to come together to, to not be as depressed as I was. Uh, so that was a real eye opener. But when I moved out of the house, I also understand that I can't be the only person in the world who has been affected by this in uh, this way. There's got to be a lot of people who think they are depressed, who think they are anxious, have sociophobia, and their guts are messed up, and they have brain fog, and they just accept it and they just live life like that, just like the doctors tell them to do. And uh, so that's when I understood that someone has to do something about it. And uh, if there's not enough people doing it, then the person that should do it might be me. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's some story. Jesus. That's. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. It's I have, um, plenty of follow-up questions. Do you think... Um, which is worse, a colder climate or a warmer climate for mold? I think Sweden has the perfect conditions for mold. So we have uh, warm summers and cold winters. And when we go from winter to mm. spring, there's like, it, it can be 30 degrees plus in, in the day, in the daytime. And at, at night, it can be. 20 degrees below zero, which is just perfect environment for mold. So it's, is that to do with like, there's obviously, uh, there's a lot of humidity in the air mm -hmm. and then yeah. that quick change to coal. Yeah. But the house isn't, the house doesn't dry like the air outside would. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And then the cold. It, yeah. It's a discrepancy between the inside and the outside. And the fluctuations are also the out of it. Like if and that's where you get condensation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, and obviously here in the UK is quite similar, not maybe not as extreme. Um, and, and perhaps like, yeah, some, just as insidious as well, because it's it, like, it ends up being more hidden because it's maybe not as obvious. Uh, yeah, so like somewhere with a... that you don't think about it while it could be mold as well like if you have warm summers again you have probably air mm -hmm. conditioning in your car and the air condition gets cold and then you stop the car and it gets warm again so it gets moist and then the next time you start an engine you just blow out all the mycotoxins right in your face and then you uh, it's no. back and forth all the time so that's, <laughs> that's also a good fucking hell 
Yeah, and then if you have air conditioning in inside your house, it's the same thing. And if you have air conditioning in office spaces, there, there could be one air conditioning, one office space, and then you just blow out mold all over the whole office space. And you affect 50 people at the same time. Bloody hell. I just got yeah. a, like a new car as well, and it's got <laughs> air conditioning, which is lovely. Yeah, and now you've um, just ruined it. <laughs> yeah, <you went>, um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I was listening to your talk as well, and full transparency, I was just getting like major anxiety. <laughs> you know, when like, it's like that's, is it like the sympathetic response almost? I'm like thinking about this mold and kind of like, oh. <laughs> um, well, I, I want to be like, we can fix this. I want to be positive. Yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Like reaction, yeah. Well, you've got to provide like the pain first, right? Give me some pain to stimulate gotcha. enough and then offer a solution. Um, okay. Let's, let's, so let's stay, stay on mold specifically. Um, what are the things that we can do to one, um, you know, check for mold? and to combat it so it is tricky but it, uh, the thing that you most care about like the thing that makes a difference for you is whether you have it inside of yourself if there could be mold in your oh. office and there could be <laughs> mold in your car and all of those things and that's not that's not cool but if you have it producing mold toxins inside of your own gut 24 hours a day. Like that's the most potent way to get incredibly fucked up real fast. So <laughs> that's what Jeez. I think that you should, should test first. Like make a, a, a urine test from a, a laboratory that's um, unbiased. Uh, and the best one that I know is called Great Plains Laboratory. Uh, and so you measure the amount of mycotoxins that you have in your, in your urine, and you also get to know which kind of uh, mycotoxins you're exposed to. So there's different kinds. There's uh, penicillium, for example, that's one uh, kind of mold toxin, and there's aspergillus have another. Did you, sorry, did you say mycelium? Uh, I said, yeah. I was, mycelium is one, but penicillium is Oh, pen, one, that, penicillium. That, that, yeah, which is obviously where pen penicillin comes from, right? <laughs> exactly. So okay, yeah, it comes yeah, from, sorry. A, from a mold toxin. I don't know if people know that. Um, and so mm. then they get to know which kind of mold toxins you're exposed to, and different kind of. You can take something called binders, activated charcoal and bentonite clay and cholestyramine, for example, are examples of binders so you take them orally and they get into your gut and when they're in your gut they bind to the toxins and they pull it out the natural way so to speak instead of the toxins going into your bloodstream and going through your liver and your kidneys and you have to uh, detox it the old-fashioned way so um mm. the way that so you tell get... me um Go ahead. sorry just to quickly interrupt um you mentioned some binders there uh can you just run over them again? Because you spoke a little bit quickly. I see. For me, everyone else can probably uh, probably took it, but I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So there's something called binders, and yep. when you ingest them orally, they go into your gut and they bind to toxins inside of your gut. Not only the mycotoxins, but also toxins that we produce naturally from our bacteria in our gut that are a normal byproduct of making energy, like lipopolysaccharides, for example, and aldehyde, which is actually an alcohol that fungi makes. And if you have those bacteria and fungi inside of your gut, you're going to get toxins in your gut 24 hours a day. And things like activated charcoal, bentonite clay, cholestyramine, which is a prescription medication, but also psyllium husk and all kinds of fibers really bind to toxins inside your gut and pull them out. Uh, and to be really specific, they don't bind to the toxins, they bind to the bile. So bile is the thing that your liver produces and stores in your gallbladder. And your gallbladder releases bile when there's something 
that is fat soluble in your digestive tract and the toxins are fat soluble so they bind to the bile and if you recycle the bile over and over you also recycle the toxins over and over so if you can bind the bile and pull it out so it ends up in the toilet then your liver gets a chance to produce new bile that is free of toxins okay so let's just hover over that for a little while so if we take a binder such as activated charcoal um that can allow um that will bind to the bile within your gut and allow it to to clear out and then regenerate is that correct so are there any downsides for, like what one of the things I was thinking of was like um like anti nutrients you know like they say about things like um certain types of vegetables or beans did that does that work in a similar way or is it different mm, uh, as far as I'm concerned that's still um I a completely different mechanism because uh, but bile is um just the fat soluble things and um, the defense mechanisms that plants have they're there to kind of don't make you eat the plant because they don't they want to survive and they can't uh, run away so they have a, a mechanism so that you can't absorb uh, the nutrients and therefore in the future you don't want to eat them again so if you don't absorb the nutrients you don't want to eat them as much in the future again that's gonna be plant oh again. so so it's not is there what, what is there certain foods where people say that the the food actually absorbs minerals from your gut? I've heard that before. Is that not necessarily a th the, the foods absorbs minerals from your gut? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's uh, that's kind of the way that the anti nutrients work. They they pull the nutrients from your gut, so you don't absorb them. And they they can even like they can even pull minerals that you have absorbed earlier at another time so that you get actually depleted even more uh, of nutrients by eating anti-nutrients mm. which is pretty messed and, up and just to be clear that's totally separate to something like a binder that you mentioned previously yeah 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 exactly it's uh, it's completely different um okay. both of them are negative consequences uh, of course but uh, they're working separate uh, mechanisms interesting so I want to just rewind a little bit. So we're talking about getting um, a urine test for microtoxins. You recommended which lab? Uh, there's one in the US. It's called um, Great Plains Laboratory. Great Plains that's Laboratory. That's the best one that I know. And do they do worldwide? Yes, they do. Oh, I'm okay. that, so. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The way that it works practically is that they send you a bag, and uh, in the bag there's um, a cup uh, which you can pee in, and there's an ice pack, and then there's another bag, and there's a hazard bag, and then there's a, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, and uh, insulation <laughs> so that mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. get destroyed. And there is a prepaid uh, FedEx uh, package that you can send it back. So you, you put the ice pack in the fridge, and then you stop taking binders and you stop taking vitamin C and glutathione for a couple of days, so that you only use your body's natural way of excreting the toxins, so you don't distort the results that you get. Uh, because if you take something like glutathione or vitamin C, you can pull out a lo lot of more toxins from your stored fat stores, and that way you would get a worse result if you send that into uh, Great Plains Laboratory. Mm. So and presumably, just... if we could also, I, I imagine Great Plains might be quite expensive if, if it's a worldwide thing, but just if someone searched um, microtoxin urine test, that should bring up something. But obviously, they would have to do their own due diligence on the yeah, I, I paid six hundred dollars for it, and I I would say it's uh, totally worth it every day, every week. For me, it was, yeah, uh, lifesaver. It's just getting your hands on the six hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> but when you think also, like polyurethane I'm talking about, they still benefit you, even mm -hmm. if you don't have a result from Great Plains Laboratory that says you have been exposed to mycotoxins. Like everyone alive has more toxins today than we should have. And mm -hmm. we have a lot more toxins than our forefathers have and our ancestors mm -hmm. have. So everyone is going to benefit from taking after that charcoal. You don't need to take a test if you don't need to prove anything for yourself. The oh, so there's no I downside to taking to activated charcoal? Absolutely not. So, so I, uh, the, the biggest reason why I took the test was to be able to prove to my future customers and clients and you <laughs> that I was actually exposed uh, to mold. So I'm now we have proof, but if I was just going to say, oh, my girlfriend collapsed and I collapsed and my brain fucked up and everything, then no one would believe me. And they still don't believe me, but now at least they have a reason to believe me a little bit more. And so you, yeah. you activate your charcoal also binds to water and it binds to gas. So if you have gas after you eat, you can take activate charcoal and that will make the thing better. Uh, but it also binds to water, so it can make you constipated. So it's important to drink a lot of liquid, something mm -hmm. that I hope you're doing anyway. Um, but it's more important oh, yeah. to take after the charcoal. Um, what I usually suggest to people is to take uh, magnesium, uh, magnesium supplements at the same time. But Which form of magnesium? I usually recommend glycinate just because it's uh, the best absorbed and glycinate uh, is a part of making glutathione, which is our most antioxidant, so it helps the body to detoxify even more. Uh, but any form of magnesium works. Like if, if you're constipated and you go to the hospital or the ER, they give you magnesium citrate, for example, or citrate. So, <laughs> <laughs> it ends the constipation pretty fast. I didn't uh, know that. Interesting. Oh, really? Yeah. And the results. No, I didn't know magnesium citrate was uh, was a um, a laxative. Magnesium citrate. Shit, right? Um, yeah, it's easy to remember. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but also, like, if you go to the hot, the ER or you be drinking like too much alcohol or uh, being exposed to some other kind of toxins. Uh, the first, one of the first things that they do is they put a hose down your throat and, and pour um, activated charcoal and down into your digestive tract to try to bind as much uh, toxins as possible. So it's something that you still use even 10,000 years after it was discovered in, uh, in medical care. Even. Very safe thing to do. And, and when you do that, is you know, they use 200 grams, 300 grams of uh, activated charcoal at once. And if you take uh, a couple of pills with uh, activated charcoal, you might end up taking three or four grams uh, of activated charcoal. So, a lot more. Say that again. If you take some pills, you, you might uh, end up taking like three or four grams maximum of activated charcoal. And if you go to the hospital, they can give you three, four. So, oh, grams. I see. Yeah. If you had it in capsule form, right. Got you. So, so um, it's very safe to take even large amounts uh, of, uh, of these things. Just make sure that you're not being constipated by it. So try to do everything you can to not be constipated at the same time. So. Constipated by the, oh, by the charcoal. Yeah. So you can take magnesium yeah, to, to water. Off. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And there's also a myth that the activated charcoal binds to the minerals that we eat in our food. So you shouldn't take activated charcoal with your meals. So you shouldn't take it close to your meals. And most of the time what ends up happening is that people get paralyzed because they don't want to take their activated charcoal at all because they're so afraid that it's going to bind to the nutrients in the food. I've never seen that happen. And uh, I've seen studies that say that it doesn't happen that the molecules uh, from B vitamins and the minerals are too big to be expelled by the activated charcoal. So charcoal binds only to the toxins and not to the nutrients. And even if it ended up binding to the nutrients, that's still better than having toxins floating around in your brain. Mm. And so I don't think oh. it's uh, something that people should be afraid of. Just take your charcoal. Okay, and obviously, 
Um, consult your medical doctor, all the rest of it, um, oh, all the uh, caveats. Um, but also, I would say take a take a blood test, get a blood panel. Like you don't have to get anything super fancy. Um, like here in the UK, you can get them online. Um, obviously, you can get them from the GP, but it won't be as detailed. Um, and they start from about like sixty pounds upwards, and obviously, whatever you can afford. But I would say, and this is something I'm trying to get better at, if you're introducing a su supplement, start to log what you're taking when you started taking it, and to get um, take a blood test. So if you're taking, for instance, in this scenario, okay, I'm going to introduce activated charcoal. Um, make sure you get your blood done beforehand and then maybe what, like a month afterwards, and then you can look, okay, how's my B12? How's my insert, you know, fill in the blank. And then you can see for yourself that it's not changed it. Would you agree? I, uh, I totally agree. Uh, I would also love like, like how you feel and the difference mm. that you notice in your, in your mood and your energy levels and stuff like that. And because sometimes like, that test doesn't show everything, mm. but they are a good start. It's a good indication, but, um, there are more to it in my opinion. Yeah. Let, while we're on this, um, topic, because it's something I'm trying to get better at, but like, what's your approach to like tracking all these things? Because, you know, for the regular person having all, you know, a spreadsheet with all these things, which by the way, is the way I like to do it, but it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, like what are some like handy ways that we can track it or, and, or what's your approach? So am I moving the risk of uh, pissing off a little? I don't think that blood tests are always the best. Like if I got to choose, if I have a client that says, I'm on a budget and I don't want to spend a lot of money on supplements and blood tests, I would say just get the supplements and screw the blood tests and uh, keep track of how you're feeling, keep track of the, con the consistency of your poop and how often you poop and just how much brain fog you have, how you're sleeping, like a, a, a sheep sleep tracker. I can tell you most of the things that you want to have, like a whoop or an aura mm. ring, eye or a circular ring. And, um, and, and I can give you a lot of information or a Fitbit or uh, any, any of those works. Uh, and a spreadsheet, uh, you, use, you type doses and you type what you're introducing, what you're removing. And um, like, that's what I think I come into the picture. That's why I see there's such a big need for this because everyone doesn't want to keep track of all these things. And so mm. I know what to look for. I've been through this. I've gone through the whole process. Like when I was trying to detox myself, it took several years longer than it had to do. And now I can heal people in 90 days uh, when it took me four years, four years that I will never get back like, wasted. And so uh, I have kind of consultations every second week and I ask them like, how are you feeling? Do you have more energy? Do you have less energy? How's your poop? How, how's your bloat? Uh, are you less bloated? How's your face? Is it more bloated or less bloated? And all those things that I noticed in myself are indications to how much toxins and inflammation you're exposed to. And I don't need a blood test to confirm it. And then I can say, like, oh, we have more inflammation and take more activated charcoal to bind to all the toxins and then your inflammation will go down. And in the meantime, don't take any more vitamin C. So you uh, increase in your inflammation even more and don't take glutathione and don't take uh, oregano oil and stuff like that. So that's where if someone mm. like a regular person is going to like battle all these things back and forth, it's, it's going to end up really messy real fast and uh, so that's what i think i suppose is, though is... I, I would do you think the the downside though of paying attention to like how how you're feeling is that obviously there are a lot of variables there with uh placebo and nocebo and all the rest of these 
variables and obviously um we all have like a different level of self-awareness to our bodies mm -hmm. um like i've certainly noticed like as i got more interested in improving my health and stuff and re and removing toxins i become more sensitive to how my body feels um but also for like for the regular person there are so many things that could affect how you feel on the day um that then is it not useful to use a, a combination of metrics and i think that maybe that's what you're saying by the way to be more yeah, yeah, objective absolutely if uh, if you can afford it the, the combination is the absolute best and the more data we can have mm. the better it is it's always better to have more data than less data but if i got to choose between having blood tests and having them uh, spend the same amount of money on supplements i would choose the supplements every day okay. of the week but also if you're going to be like you perhaps or someone that is really high performing and like really at the top levels and you will have like everything dialed down i don't know about that but i thank you nonetheless <laughs> <laughs> then you need to have not just then you need to have uh, like objective measures and hrv and you you can need to have a lot of things but the people that i'm treating they're like i'm suicidal depressed unmotivated mm. and a week later i can function like a normal human being and then two weeks after i ask are you still functioning like a normal human being or are you depressed and suicidal and that's something that everyone can see like they don't they don't need measures for that because they yeah it's such a big discrepancy uh, and that's something that i did a lot wrong with myself in the beginning because the toxins uh, first of all our body try to detox them of course with our liver and our kidneys but if they can't they have to store them somewhere so your body says we, we can't get rid of all the toxins. There's too much toxins coming in and we can't get them all out. We need to store them somewhere. And since they're fat soluble, they're stored in fat stores. And when all the fat stores are filled, then your liver is incidentally made out of fat. So you fill up your liver with uh, toxins as well. And then the last place, when there's no other place to put it, is your brain. And that's when you get depression and brain fog and unmotivated suicide and stuff like that. And so you can pull out a lot of toxins from your stores and you need to pull them out from your stores to bind them in your gut so you can get rid of them eventually. But if you pull out too many toxins at once, you get overburdened and, and you feel like absolute mega crap. Uh, and like that's what happened to me when I lived in, in the moldy house and we collapsed. So. I, I try to always make sure that they detox some toxins and pull some toxins out of their, their fat stores, but not too much. And the difference between a, a normal amount or a good amount and a too much amount, too high amount, is really clear and visible. Like they, they noticed in a day uh, if they have lower energy, if they feel like yeah, they don't want to do anything, like they just want to lie in bed for a day. And I can... So ju ju just to clarify on that point, so what you're saying is if you detoxify too quickly, the toxins mm -hmm. are stored within fat. So therefore your body loses a lot of fat and therefore you have less energy. It's nothing to do with like the gut microbiome. No, no, not the way that I understand your question now. So you have toxins stored in your fat stores and when you pull the toxins out from your fat stores they're in circulation and when you have a lot of toxins in circulation that's when you feel like absolute... oh right 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 all right right so, so it's, it's a bit it's... like when you go for a massage and then you've got like all these toxins floating yes, around yes, you feel a little yes, bit exactly, yeah it's exactly like that but, but also that's why ultra mega obese people can be relatively healthy uh, even if you didn't think that they were and because they have a lot of toxins but they're, they're, all the toxins are stored in their fat stores and when they're stored in fat stores and they're not being released because they're eating all the time so they never need to release the, the fat stores 
they can be reasonably happy. But if they were to release all those toxins stored in all those fat stores, they would die like that. Fucking hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I just want... Um, you mentioned before about hydration. I need to pee. <laughs> <laughs> This is the this is the downside. I'm like this is the part that we get out, right? I that... Yeah, that like there's a guy, one of the coaches in the gym says the, I'm the most hydrated man in in England. Yeah, you're I don't know about that, but um, yeah. So I'll just be two minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I started looking at my Whoop data. No, I think I've had my Whoop for like. I don't know, like maybe 18 months. Um, and it and it's difficult because I don't have any data before the whoop. So basically, I think I notice like my overall trend, despite getting like, I, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in. I'm faster than I've ever been. I'm stronger than I've ever been. And yet, my HRV has slowly started to go down over time. Mm. My respiratory rate, a bit more stable, but that's also risen a little bit. My resting heart rate fluctuates a bit more due to like maybe how much cardio I'm doing. But again, in general, that's also started to rise a little bit. What's the other metric? There's one more, isn't there? Um, but yeah, that gives that gives you an overview. Nice. So, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> so, if your body is like trying to ramp up your system, so you ha it raises your metabolism, it raises your uh, heart rate, it raises your blood pressure potentially. I don't know if you checked that, but. All of those things. Uh, I should, but I, yeah, I don't, but I should. Yeah, it's an indication that your body is trying to get rid uh, of all the things that it's trying to get rid of, potentially multiple toxins in this uh, case. Uh, but it could be any kind of toxins and we produce toxins inside of us. So even if it, they are not in the same situation as you are, we're still always being uh, exposed to toxins. Uh, but the first thing that your body does is it's trying to ramp up your system, so it's trying to ramp up your metabolism, it's trying to detox more so you can get rid of everything. But then when people normally notice it, it's when your body says, stop, I can't, uh, there's no way for me to get rid of all these toxins. My uh, fat stores are filled up, my liver is filled up, we can, there's more toxins coming in than we can get rid of. We need to slow down and conserve our energy and that's when you get low motivation that's when you get low energy and that's when you get depressed and all of those things that your body is trying to do to conserve the little amount of energy that you do have so potentially that could be in store for you in the future if you don't do anything about it which i hope you will mm, yeah and, and i've also for, for what it's worth like blood panels um maybe related but like uh like my liver function is not very good um is it like alt um creatine levels stuff like that so uh, yeah i've been told i'm actually at the moment i'm stopping taking creatine and then i'm retesting soon so to take a look at that I wouldn't draw any conclusions on the liver values alone. Like if you have everything in combination, then maybe, but the liver values can also be an indication that you have more muscles in your body. So it can go up when you take creatine, like you say, and uh, also when you have more muscles in general. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, so, so yeah, let's hover over that one actually. So, one of my friends said to me, he said, oh yeah, I was the same and I stopped creatine, stopped taking creatine and then I got tested and then it cleared up and then yeah. I just don't take creatine now. 
would you say that maybe that's not a sensible approach? There was a hasty conclusion, yeah. So, uh, but just because you take in the creatine and the liver values goes up doesn't mean that your liver is fucked. It just means that your liver values went up. So uh, it could just be that your liver is fine and you can take creatine and you just have high liver values and there's nothing wrong with it or there's nothing uh, potentially dangerous at all with it. And which, and so at what point would you, at what point would you see an issue potentially with the liver? Like what, what, <laughs> what, what mark are you looking for there? The only way to get a reasonably decent conclusion of what is happening with your liver is to do a biopsy. And so I know a lot about this because the woman that I was living with in the moldy house, she incidentally had uh, autoimmune disease where her liver was being attacked. So she always had high uh, liver values. Um, but when they did biopsies, they did that. Um, once a month on her, uh, it was always fine. Um, wow. Yeah, so a and, liver biopsy, also, like you're cutting the liver open, right? Yeah. Wow. Once a month. Yeah. So, Fucking so hell. It's, um, it's kind of a, a spear that you put in the liver and then you push it off them and it's uh, desiccates a bit of your liver and you pull it out and then the liver regenerates and restores itself. You can lose 95% of your liver and it will still generate back to 100% if you give it enough time. Uh, so she didn't like, she didn't make any hassle of it. She, she said she didn't even feel it. Okay. Interesting. Uh, but about the other values, I don't think uh, you can just draw a conclusion she was based on them uh, because she did take those values as well. But, uh, it was always the biopsy where you can actually see is there fat, is there, is the liver damaged in any way. And usually mm. it's not. Like the liver is really capable of uh, dealing with a lot of toxins. There are uh, alcoholics that can drink a lot of alcohol for 50 years and the liver is still fine. A lot of other organs in your body are not fine, but uh, the liver is still fine. And I thought that my liver would be fucked up after I lived in a moldy house and also, what happens when you live in a moldy house or get exposed to a lot of other toxins is that uh, you have a gut microbiome and it's supposed to be some part good bacteria and some part bad bacteria. But if your immune system is always busy trying to get rid of the uh, mold toxins or mycotoxins, then uh, the bad bacteria uh, can take over. So they're called opportunistic bacteria because they take the opportunity when your immune system is busy and then they take over the small intestine for example which should be uh, sterile and then they get up into your throat and your nose and then you get ear infections and nose infections and a sinus infection and you get a white tongue and thrush it's called thrush when you have a white tongue because fungi is living there and a lot of people live like this uh, their whole lives. And when I was a kid, I was always stuffed in my nose. Now they're cleared out my microbiome. They all are cleared up as well. So, uh, But what happens when they're living in places where they shouldn't be, a, a normal thing uh, when they're making energy is that they produce toxins as a byproduct of making energy. So the more, the higher amount of bacteria that you have, the more toxins you're going to create. So if you have a lot of extra bacteria in your small intestine, for example, that's going to produce a lot of extra lipopolysaccharides, for example, which is uh, the most common toxin that we produce in our gut. And that will destroy the inside of your gut lining, your leaky gut. And then when you have leaky gut, the toxins can pierce into the bloodstream and then they circulate into your brain and there's just a, a, a vicious cycle of bad things that happens when you get exposed to mold. It's not just the mold itself. That's what triggers the whole process. But what is actually good doing the most amount of damage is the uh, opportunistic bacteria that takes over uh, when they get a chance because your immune system is always busy. 
be mycotoxins. And uh, I got fungi, I got candida, I got small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I made a similar bowel syndrome, I had chronic diarrhea for years because I was exposed to the mold. And that's how it all started. But so practically the things that you have to solve after you get exposed to mold, it's not just to get rid of the mold and detox your body from mold, that's the first step. But then you have to take care of all the damage that happened to your body after that. So. You have to fix your gut, you have to uh, fix your small intestine, you have to fix your digestion, and then you have to give all the nutrients back, which all of the bacteria and fungi stole from you before. And uh, and then you have to fix your mitochondria, which is the powerhouses in your cells that make energy, uh, because they get damaged as well from mycotoxins. And uh, ocratoxin A, for example, which is the most common mycotoxin directly uh, destroys part of your hippocampus so you can't make enough dopamine so that's another reason why you get unmotivated and uh, low energy mm -hmm. and and that's why like part of your brain that is destroyed it's not just that you don't have the raw materials like tyrosine and B vitamin b6 to make dopamine you have that as well <laughs> but you also have parts of your brain that are literally destroyed and that needs time and energy and nutrients to rebuild itself and that can take years wow so did i scare you enough <laughs> yeah you can say that um just moving back slightly a little bit so we're talking about um like a moldy house for example what about the actual house? Can you do anything about it? The best thing to do is to just cut out the piece that is moldy and replace it with a new piece that is not moldy. Uh, but the, the thing is that it's hard to see. Like it can be, if you see it, you are potentially doing something about it, but that's the uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. But if it's in your bathroom behind the drywall, and there's a, a leak in a pipe, you don't see it, you don't smell it, you don't know that it's yeah. there. Like, I don't even know in the house where exactly the mold was. Like, it, it's so hard uh, to find. Like, yeah, yeah. sometimes it can be hidden for, for years. Uh, what about, like, like um, like, you know, testing, like, the atmosphere with, um, like, a, a, a moisture detector? Would that be useful? All of those things are useful, um, but they're absolutely not even far from 100% perfect. So I have a friend, for example, who lives uh, nearby, and uh, his house is also like really old. He bought it from his great great grandpa. And um, when you when you get in there, you have, like you can smell the mold from from a hundred miles <laughs> away. And every time I, I go from that house, my, my girlfriend tells me like, oh, you've been at your friend's house again. Um, and he says that when he has meetings, everyone says that, oh, is it mold here? And he knows that it's just mold on his cloth that is uh, giving the smell. So there's 100% mold in his house. And so they do an expert there uh, to check. So usually they do something called an EMRI environmental mold relative index so you check the amount of mycotoxins that you have in the air inside the house and then you compare it to the air outside of the house and if it's relatively more uh, mycotoxins inside of the house then you can conclude that there's mold in the house uh, but even in that house he made the conclusion the professional that there's no mold in the house and so I Why? don't know how he, he came up with that conclusion. Uh, he said that there was uh, the same amount of um, mycotoxins in the air inside the house as it was outside of the house. But like I can clearly smell uh, the, the mold there. And I can even go into the house and get brain fog. Like in, I can induce brain fog on myself in two hours time. Um, that's how much mold toxins there is there. Um, so I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, like he's a really good friend of mine, but his, his family has gained like 300 kilograms uh, together 
I often he moved into that house and uh, I am pretty sure it has to do with, uh, with the mold, so. Um, but wow. he doesn't do anything wrong, he's an expert says that and there's nothing to do. So, so okay, so let's say, um, let's say you have a test done, there is mold in the house, you've you can confirm it um that there's toxins you know in in the atmosphere so so the way that they last way it is credited is that if you have an expert that bangs on the pipes he knows what he's doing basically he can steer up the mold so if if he if there's mold on top of the bookshelves for example when he gets a, a lot of dirt in the same place that can create mold and yeah, if you know where to look for mold, you're going to find it, even if someone who's a professional might not find it, basically. So you have to have the right person check for mold. But let's say that you find, you know that there's mold, and you don't ex exactly know where it is, or for uh, some other reason, you don't want to like remove it or do something about it. Uh, opening the windows is a really great idea, and uh, also having an air cleaner is a good idea and um, just when you say a cleaner everything. is that different from a humidifier or is that the same thing it, it is it is different uh, so uh, okay a cleaner could, could have an activated short cold filter in it for example so you pull the air in and it goes through an activated short cold filter and then it, uh, the air comes out potentially a cleaner and all of those things are better than nothing definitely would um could you still use an air cleaner and have the window open yes like does, yes. does that yeah. make sense all, yeah all, all things yeah all things in combined makes uh, a lot of sense yeah so you, yeah you add, adds up and all of the things makes it better but not perfect and um, if you think about it like mold is, is not something new it, it didn't like show up in the uh, 2000 like now uh, we've had mold for thousands of years but it's being diluted in the air around us uh, so so if you have you're sleeping next to a, a moldy tree or a tree bark for example out in the wood it's still the same amount of mo mycotoxins that you're being exposed to but it's being diluted with trillions of liters of uh, air around you so it, it isn't as toxic for you uh, when you Mm. Uh, so that okay so that's why obviously the windows makes a lot of sense yeah but if it's minus 30 degrees celsius <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. that becomes a little bit more problematic yeah you have to prioritize yeah i think the, um, the i've not seen it that cold here i think that the coldest i've ever seen it in the uk was like minus was it minus 17 minus 14 years ago but yeah, we we to be honest as well. Since like uh, global warming, <sighs> we ha it's rare we we get below freezing at the moment. Oh, nice. But what is the reason why someone would not want to get rid of the mold if they know they have mold? Oh, are you asking me that? Yeah. Uh, what reasons would they not want to get rid of it? I'm not, I don't think there's any reason someone wouldn't want to get rid of it, but I suppose if there's like a, there's a financial element or, you know, for instance, if the, you know, if the, for example, they just couldn't move from that house, I suppose that was, that would be the only, you know, the only restriction that I can think of. Um, I mean, you, you wouldn't want to sell it necessarily to someone else to get the same kind of problems that you have either, but... I, yeah, if you can find the mold, like, and it's this big, and and you can just buy new dry wood and replace it. It takes five minutes, and your environment is a lot cleaner, and you solve the problem potentially forever. Uh, so, but the, the hard thing, I guess, would be to find it if it's behind a wall, for example. Then it would be more uh, problematic. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So one of the things, um, you know, so let's just talk about like what mold is doing 
and is like what's so you mentioned about like dogs that be, a dog would start to attack people or, or whatever is there like um it, it is the toxin like taking over the brain so that it then infects other people is it like you know have you seen last of us <laughs> is it like um uh, yeah does that make that sense First of all, I, I know it's true for dogs as well, because dogs is, or all animals is mostly, like a lot of times it's the first thing that you, you noticed, uh, because you don't notice as much in yourself, as you say, but you can see it easier in others, and, and dogs, they behave really weird when they're exposed to mold, and uh, the oldest dog that we had, it was a St. Bernard, and he literally had mold growing in, out of his head. So it's like mold here. It was like, oh, wow. like this big. Fucking hell. Uh, and yeah, and then he passed away from it eventually. <sighs> but it's not like the mold is like attacking your brain or it's not like you becoming a zombie, but all the, the toxins, regardless of what kind of toxins, but mold toxins in this case, they activate your immune system and your immune system requires energy and the more toxins you have, the more energy you need to expand on dealing with the toxins. And if all your energy goes to the toxins, not enough energy can go to the brain. And when the brain doesn't have enough energy, that's when you get cranky, that's when you get easy irritable, and that's when you get depressed and unmotivated and you can literally I do literally induce low motivation and depression in someone just by detoxing them too fast. Wow. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, so let's say we've looked at the house, we found the 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 mold, we've had um maybe like a damp expert or a mold expert come in, we've replaced the, the bit of the wall, we've painted everything up we're monitoring the moisture levels we've got that you know and we've got that underway we've maybe we've started taking activated charcoal mm -hmm. i'm starting to feel a little bit better what else should i do is it just like over time just start to so on all the time 24 hours a day you're burning some amount of fat like recently if you're not gaining fat all the time and every time you're burning your fat you're releasing the toxins that are stored in the fat so therefore there's always some amount of toxins inside of your gut in your digestive tract and so if you then take actually short code you can bind those toxins so you can poop them out and the toxins that you can't bind your liver and kidneys can deal with and over time the more of the toxins you can pull out from your fat stores and now that you fix the house you don't fill up your uh, fat stores anymore and you don't get exposed to more so eventually you have empty fat stores and empty digestive tract and then you will only only have potentially a pathogenic bacteria that has taken over while you were being exposed to the toxins and so you, you can take vitamin C uh, and acetyl L system and AC uh, and combine those two. Oh yeah, NAC. Or 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 so yeah, NAC. Or take you get a fion, uh, which is delivers uh, monster antioxidant, and you can take um, magnesium uh, to, to pull things out of the fat stores into your digestive tract, so that you then can bind to the activated charcoal and put that out. So. You can speed up the process, but if you speed up the process, you run the risk of having too much toxins, uh, but then you can increase the amount of actually short code instead, so you bind to uh, all the toxins, and then you, you just keep doing it. You keep releasing the toxins, and then you bind them, and then you release some more, and then you bind them, and, and you go on like that uh, until you don't have any more, or don't have a significant amount of uh, toxins, because you always going to have toxins where human being living in a world where where there's toxins everywhere so you're always going to have some small amount of toxins and then there's 
always a sounds more uh, my productions even in in food so um. you're always going to get a little and uh, the way that if you want to be like like the top top notch dog uh, you can take um butter and saturated fats and the more saturated fats you eat the more you can replace your old fat cells that are potentially filled with polyunsaturated fats and toxins you can excrete them and when you're excreting them you, you're going to feel worse because you're releasing all the toxins but the more saturated fats you eat you can replace and the old bad cells with new good cells and that way uh, potentially you would get rid of the most amount of toxins so if you imagine a glass of water and uh, you have um, paint or uh, what do you call it um, caramel paint like the one you you have when you're making food food coloring food uh, oh right okay yeah like a food yeah like a what like a food. caramel coloring yeah yeah exactly yeah so, so first it's just at the top of the water but then it spreads more and more more uh -huh. and more and then eventually it fills the whole glass and, and the whole glass is filled with the color when it was just clear water to begin with and taking binders is like taking a pipette is that how you say it and and, uh, and pull water out yeah yeah like um like a squeezy thing the pipette yeah, squeezy thing. Yeah. and you pull out water and that yeah. way, it's really hard to make the whole glass clear again. <laughs> you mm. understand what I mean? So, so, uh, so, so just to, so the, the, the caramel coloring in this example, that's the toxin. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the, and the, and the water is the, the water fat. The water is fat, fat cell, yeah. And that's how okay. toxins spread in, in our body because all our cells, they have a membrane around them and that is made out of fat. So that, when they touch each other, they spread to each other. So it's just like the food coloring that it spreads in the glass. And you can you can try to pull it out, like you need to try to pull out on the color from the glass, but it's not going to make the glass completely clear. But what you need to do is that you need to dilute uh, the water with new fats. And the more you, the more water you add, and the uh, the more you can add the water without food coloring in it, the clearer the water is going to get. So eventually the glass is going to be completely clear uh, if you don't put any new toxins in it. So that's uh, the right. best way to, to do it if you want to replace all your fat cells. So what we're saying is, just to, to recap that, the pipette example of just taking the water that's mixed with the 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 fat sorry the, the water that's mixed with the coloring or the the fat that's mixed with the toxins that's like the binder okay so it does help but obviously it's not the full solution the full solution is to make sure you're eating plenty of saturated fat to replace those things yeah that leads me on to my next uh question is uh saturated fat so interestingly enough when we're looking at uh biomarkers my uh, my ldl and my triglycerides are like really high and of course the traditional model here in the uk and in most places is ldl cholesterol bad um you want to get rid of it um obviously there is lots of conflicting opinions around that such as like apob so it's not ldl you should look at your apob number i don't know my apob number because that's not a standardized test and then someone in the carnivore world will argue further, say there's nothing wrong with ApoB. It's to do with your insulin resistance. That's the thing that causes that and the atherosclerosis. So, on, uh, so, but recently, 
I think I got a little bit scared because I feel a little bit alone in like, yeah, well, I'm eating all this red meat and I'm fucking smashing it. I feel great. I'm lifting more. I'm running more. Nice, Give nice. me more ribeye steak. But when your blood markers are coming up and then, you you know, I guess you just want to do the right thing. And when there's so many people saying you're going to get um, cardiac disease if you're going to have these high high numbers, how should we look at these things? What's your opinion, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, that, that example is a direct quote from uh, De Gasperi, so I don't want to take credit for something that I can say. Uh, I want to get credit where credit is due. Uh, but uh, regarding the saturated fat and LDL, so the way that I understood it is, uh, first of all, there was a, a big uh, study that was done, and they looked at people who had high LDL and people who had the lowest amount of LDL, and the people who had the highest amount of LDL died more often, basically. But there was a lot of examples from that study that didn't get into to get to the end of the study, because they didn't fit the pattern, basically. And so that's funny uh, that they chose seven countries that all had high LDL and people died, but those other countries that had, had high LDL but didn't die, but those didn't get to end up in the study. Do we know um, like what kind of countries they were? Give me an idea. Um, it, the study is really famous, and I should know the name of it right now, but uh, I'm blanking. So, uh, well, maybe we can link it in the show notes. Is, like, if you send me it later, I'd be interested. Yeah, it's brain, it. um, I have it here in, in my bookshelf. Anyway, and so the way that they concluded that. Uh, um, high LDL was bad was that people who had high LDL also died. But just because you have high LDL and you die more often doesn't mean that LDL is bad. Correlation is not causation. Yeah, it could also mean that someone was about to die and the LDL was coming to save this the person, was trying to save the person that failed. And that's why they had high LDL when they died. So the LDL oh, was wow. trying to save the situation. So okay, for so... Example, so for example, we have um, arteries. Your arteries uh, get damaged all the time when blood is passing through. And you get small microscopic holes. And when you get small microscopic holes, LDL is being shot there to patch up the hole. And the more you damage the walls, the more LDL uh, gets there. And eventually okay. you build up like, uh, plaque. like a bold, yeah, yeah, a plaque, a bold of LDL. So now the blood can't get through. And so that's when you get a heart attack or a stroke. And so then, then you could conclude that the LDL was the reason why they got a heart attack and a stroke because the LDL was in the way, so the back and the blood couldn't pass through. But in reality, LDL was trying to save the person from getting a burst in their blood vessel. And the problem from the beginning was that they were damaging the blood vessel so much. So if they didn't damage the blood vessel, LDL wouldn't have to come there to try to patch up all the, the damage all the time. And where is the damage coming from? And like, well, we're always being damaged. Like, uh, if you just blood is passing through, like if toxins uh -huh. is passing through, that makes even more damage. But just blood passing through, or having higher blood pressure, of course, is going to damage the walls uh, even more. Um, but because the there's time, more, because there's more pressure on the pipe, exactly. it's more likely to to break. Exactly. Yeah, and so we're supposed to always heal those small holes all the time uh, if you have enough collagen, which is what uh, blood vessels are mostly made of. And most of our body, or most of the proteins in our body is collagen, but no one is eating uh, ligaments and tendons and skin nowadays. So we get 
the deficiency of collagen and protein. So yeah, we can't repair the blood vessels and then they will have to come there. So in that case, you could also say that you had high LDL and the person died. So in that case, yeah, high LDL was bad because it, it made them die, but it wasn't LDL's fault necessarily. It was because LDL was trying to save them from something completely different, which they didn't have to have if they ate enough collagen or vitamin C or whatever to heal their arteries. Wow. I'd never heard this uh, perspective. Cool. So interesting. So also, there's a lot of the perspectives about LDL, like just the sheer fact that you're eating saturated fats. And saturated needs a transport vehicle in your body to deliver energy. Um, uh -huh. That is LDL. So you're increasing your LDL just by eating saturated fats. And um, that's not necessarily bad. It just means that you have more energy from fats than you did before. So, okay. So if we looked at something like insulin resistance, also known as pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, mm. um, your body stops responding to insulin um, because there's just so much of it around. And then obviously it stops taking nutrients in as well as a side effect. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is if you are, let's just use the example, let's say pre-diabetic, pre-diabetic as for the, for, for, for the sake of this next example, you're pre-diabetic. Is it the side effect of the excess blood glucose, which is going to cause damage to the to the um the blood vessel walls and or, or, or is it uh because of the side effect of having um high glucose levels means that you're going to have high blood pressure which means that you're going to get damage mm -hmm. so so like having high blood pressure can come from having high blood sugar and having high blood pressure would lead to your intestinal or your um, blood arteries walls getting damaged faster. Mm. Uh, where the insulin resistance or the pre-diabetes or even diabetes comes from in the first place is also something that is up for debate. Uh, but my theory is that it does not have to do necessarily with the high blood sugar at all, uh, which might be a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, but I think that we should be able to have high blood sugars and then regulate down the blood sugar again uh, because we're making so much energy from the sugar, uh, just like a kid can do. They can eat a lot of candy and then they can use the sugars and get their blood sugar to normal levels and make energy out of it. Uh, but when you get older and you get exposed to toxins, and I think also bad fats has a lot to do with it, um, but I do, or, or just your mitochondria, the powerhouses in your cells stops working. If So if the powerhouses in your cells can't make energy, then you can't pull the uh, sugars from the bloodstream into the cells. And that's what we uh, call diabetes. So if you don't have proper functioning mitochondria, then you get uh, diabetes. Uh, uh, what's a, a common symptom of um, non-functional my mitochondria? So uh, mitochondria is what makes energy for everything. So basically you can get symptoms everywhere um, but when you get exposed to mold toxins for example the reason why you have um, symptoms is partly because it damages your mitochondria so much so what i had was the brain fog your brain stops working when cells in your brain doesn't get enough energy your eyes uh, starts uh, 
stops working, so you don't get bad vision, and uh, your digestive tract stops working, so you get constipated and uh, you can't absorb the nutrients and you don't have any energy, you get depressed and anxious. And a lot of the things that a lot of people have normally nowadays, just like you could, you could think that it's just normal symptoms from just being older or a normal aging. Mm. Uh, but these things, you, you can fix your mitochondria. It can help your mitochondria to regrow and be able to make energy again. Um, but anything, like anything in the whole world, uh, and the back pain, like the uh, hands make and the uh, sleep disturbances, insomnia, everything that requires uh, energy, I can take it be if, if your mitochondria isn't working. Are you familiar with Peter Atia? Yeah, the first step. So, one of the things, um, just Rewinding a little bit to uh, the LDL thing, he said to, I think he was talking to Rhonda Patrick, and he said his argument for why we should be lowering APOB slash LDL, APOB with pharmacology, his argument Less was, y yeah, I think, yeah, which... We yeah let let's put a pin in that let's talk about statins too. Um, his um, his example was that if you take um, like an infant or a, a toddler, they have no LDL. So um, and he was responding to say someone like Paul Saladino who who'd be saying that um, we need this for energy and stuff. So he'll say, well, why doesn't a child need have LDL? Um, but I feel like what you're going to say is because the LDL is about repair and that's something we need later in life. From Borky, yeah. What do you think about that? Like, uh, the LDL has a lot of things. Like, LDL is not even, like we say LDL is uh, cholesterol, but it's pretty far from cholesterol. LDL is a, a protein and it transports different things in your bloodstream that are fat soluble because Fats can't be transported in water, which are arteries of water. Mm. And that's why we need LDL. And it's not right to call it cholesterol, because cholesterol is just one thing that's being transported on the LDL protein. And also, what, what about, um, sorry. So, sorry to interrupt. Um, okay. What about APOB spe specifically? I'm just checking. Are we, are we splitting those things out? Or are we talking about it separately? Uh, are we... I think it may sense that different sizes of uh, particles can have a huge difference, yes. So I'm not arguing with that at all. I think that that is probably the best measure that we can have, like Peter T. S. S. So if you, so, yeah, so pay attention to a, a high APO B number is problematic, you would say. I would say it's probably the best indication, yes. Uh, I would also like to add that in a lot of cases, but not in all cases, high LDL is a, a warning signal. Like you should praise your eyebrows if you have high LDL. And because mm -hmm. I've had high LDL my whole life, and I've always justified it because like, the yeah. energy and uh, it's my genes, uh, always have it so I can't do anything about it and uh, incidentally LDL also helps uh, when you're um, detoxing and when you're being exposed to mold toxin and stuff like that so when I detox from mold I saw my LDL go down even if I was doing keto and high fats and so I know you can have mm. low LDL even if you're eating a lot of fat and a lot of people just justify having high LDL but it could be uh, toxins that are controlled. Yeah, fucking hell, LDL. right. Yeah, right, yeah. So what we're saying is actually as well, and other people might have probably came to this example much earlier, uh, probably came to this realization much earlier than me, but it's just kind of like light bulb. So what we're saying is, LDL is perhaps a warning signal, 
but not in the way you think of it. It may be because it's going like, let's fucking fix this. Like, so you have more in your bloodstream. Yeah. 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 I come to things slow, but once <laughs> I get them, I will become obsessive and learn more than most. <laughs> yeah. I, I really don't make a uh, fan of sense. Yeah. And, uh, the, the particle size, if anything, is what we should be worried about. Like A equal to B, for example. Mm. Like either a TSS. Continuous glucose monitoring. Should we be doing it? I think it makes sense to know your blood glucose. Or it can tell you a lot of things, even though I, as I said, I think that we should be able to have our blood glucose go down a couple of hours after we eat. Uh, but if you have a continuous glucose monitor for a month, for example, you can see how how high it is and you can see in real time what happens when you eat the different junk food i think you know example, what it feels like to have a sugar rush yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, i think that's the best be thing to... i got from it <laughs> yeah you should be able to eat ice cream and, and uh, drink milk and eat rice which has higher glycemic index to sugar and and then get back to baseline pretty fast again but if you notice that you don't uh, then you can see that there's something that needs uh, improvement here. So and you can do it the old fashioned way. Like I, I had a glucose monitor and I stuck myself 20 times a day for a month. Uh, and yeah, I with a pin, but the finger way. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but knowing your, your uh, blood glucose is a really good thing. And it's uh, the best indication that we have whether you're going to get diabetes type two or not. And I think it's type two contributes to all the four major killers. So it makes us to keep track of it. 